Hello and welcome everybody. If you're brand new today, I'm Lionheart, Lionheart X10, and I'm being joined by Professor Ryan Lavelle. And we have a very special stream today, Field of Glory 2 Medieval, a recreation of the Battle of Hastings. Uh, I'm going to be playing as the Normans and uh, seeing how we fare. This is a, a pretty difficult battle that I, I've, I've dabbled and I've tested out some tactics so far. So it could go either way. So either we'll follow the history or we could have, um, well, the future of England could well change today. We will uh, we will see <laughs> what happens. But um, uh, Ryan, if you'd like to perhaps um, introduce yourself yeah. to the yeah, chat. It's... Yeah, I'm a professor of early medieval history at Winchester University. And uh, I was uh, one of the, the folks there who, who taught Lionheart on his medieval history degree. Uh, of, a few years ago, I, I seem to recall. <laughs> <laughs> and um, for those of you who were, um, are, are kind of expecting me to be uh, sort of fighting head to head, as, as was uh, as the, the video kind of gave the impression that we might have been sort of doing a, uh, a sort of fight night kind of scenario. Uh, I'm here as the, the sort of historical commentator. So the you know, commentator on the shapes of shields and uh, helmets and, and that sort of thing. Role, and, and, and maybe trying to provide a little bit of tactical advice uh, where, where necessary, uh, rather than the sort of head to head opponents uh, here. So Lionheart is, is coming up against uh, some AI rather than the, uh, the, the kind of uh, doctoral intelligence that, that, that I attempt to, to provide. Um, but I think had he been fighting me, um, I have a bit of a reputation as a very, very poor war gamer. Actually, I, I do, I do enjoy sort of dabbling with a, a little bit of miniatures war gaming, and uh, I, I may get the opportunity to, to show off a couple of miniatures uh, as as we go along. But uh, but I, I I tend to sort of research about it, write about it, teach about it. Uh, but when it actually comes to, to thinking about the, the sort of tactics and strategies, I, I often tend to come up with the wrong decision when it comes to the, the tabletop or the, uh, or the, or the, or the game, uh, the computer game. So, uh, but, you know, the history, the history part of it is, is great fun. So. Brilliant. Fantastic. Um, obviously, the stream has been sponsored through a collaboration of Slytherin and Immediate Media. So big thanks to them for making this all possible, bringing us uh, together to do this Battle of Hastings stream today, Ryan. Would you would you so please do the? Apparently, I'm meant to do the uh, the, the honors here. Wookie bit that uh, yeah. <laughs> that, that is provided. So I'm the, I'm the kind of reserve Wookie, so that you'll have to forgive me if it goes wrong here. But uh, a kind of kind of noise for the the subscriber. So I've, I'm I'm totally losing any kind of academic uh, credibility here. So anyone wants to subscribe and and help uh, help one of our former Winchester University graduates. Uh, you know, keep making a decent living, uh, then then please uh, do humiliate me by uh, by doing that, and I'll I'll look out for for those things. Do I have a Lego Chewy? Um, I th I believe, by the way, it's um, it's a, a Wookiee warrior rather than a, a Chewbacca, which is is how I'm justifying doing the uh, the kind of rubbish Wookiee roar, which isn't uh, you know necessarily the correct. Uh, Chewy raw, but uh, you know, uh, Wookies have have different dialects, don't they? So uh, you know, there we go. <laughs> there we go. Who do you think out of the various claimants had the strongest claim on the English throne following the the death of Edward the Confessor? Well done for reposting a question that I'd missed there. Um, well, it's, it's probably Edgar the Aetheling, actually, who's the. Uh, the, the figure who's, who's kind of pushed out of it. There's a recent biography of Edward the Confessor just come out uh, from uh, the, the Yale English Monarch series uh, by uh, Tom License, and he's, he's pointed out that basically Harold and William were both usurpers, and uh, it's, it's Harold's usurpation of the, the throne in, in January 1066 that, that, that kind of um, opens the floodgates to William being able to, to make a claim. Um, and, and actually, if you kind of look at Edward the Confessor's reign, he's he's trying to set up Edgar Aetheling as his uh, as his successor because he's of the royal dynasty. And um, Harold, however, had support and he had a reputation as a warrior. And I think that's that's uh, you know that's that's part of it really. Um, okay, we've got other other questions as well. Which which one would you uh, 
say to, to go for then, Lionheart? Um, let's take a look at uh, Lecroc, who's next. Yeah, Byzant Byzantines. Yeah, so agree with the Normans were one of the strongest powers of Europe by the mid 11th century. Probably yes, probably, probably yes. But if you consider them as as like a single group, but uh, in in some ways, Normans saw themselves as, as part of a, a group, and they they, they kind of um, you know kind of recognised um, the the common identity, um, but they weren't a sort of single political block. There's not like a sort of single Norman Empire uh, in the in the later 11th century. So the Normans in the the south of Italy were a different group from the the Normans in Normandy, and uh, arguably by the by the 12th century, the, the, the kind of descendants of Normandy in England were were a different group as well. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's uh, some some success there. So wow, there's uh, some some pretty uh, pretty hefty stuff coming through on the uh, on the Twitch stream there. Uh, so uh, there was another question. That, oh, here's another question. Estimates vary wildly as to the size of the forces between Harold and William. What's the estimate that? I use for my classes. I throw my hands around uh, wildly and gesticulate wildly in these these cases um, because I, I think the calculation for the the size of the um, the Anglo-Saxon the English force uh, at the, the battlefield of Hastings is, is partly based on like the size of the uh, the, the hill at battle and. No doubt somebody will go wild in, in, in response to that. Was the uh, was the site itself the the historical site of the uh, uh, the battle? There are some doubts about that, and um, it's kind of partly estimated on the basis of how many people could stand up along that ridge. And there's a very famous line by William of Poitiers in uh, a work called The Deeds of William, and. Uh, you can kind of guess its its sense of bias, and that the English were fighting, and they were um, sort of so closely packed that the dead couldn't actually fall down. Uh, William of Poitiers was using a classical um, classical reference point, which I, th I think is from Procopius, a, a late Roman author, about the dead falling down. <laughs> so, but basically, that that has tended to be the the use of the calculation for like six thousand uh, men stood up shoulder to shoulder along the uh, along that ridge and then it's it's all kind of uh, spirals out from there and thinking well, what's the size of the uh, the English uh, army at this point but I uh, you know I'd, I'd sort of say more than five thousand and possibly pushing ten thousand depending on on how how deeply they are um, they are ranked um, there's something like uh, 40 fifty thousand units of of land uh, in England have I got that right no 80 thousand uh, in in England so um, and then you sort of divide that by roughly five or so and you know you might get a force that that's capable of, of being fielded of, of something like 10,000 or, or something like that but remember that some of that that force will have been fighting uh, in the north of England at the battles of uh, Fulford and Stamford Bridge so we might be bringing the size of the English army uh, right down you can tell by the way that I don't want to come up with a specific number <laughs> because I don't want to be held to that yeah. uh, but you know it those are the the kinds of sizes there and it's, yeah. it's fun to do the calculations I think roughly with the the scenario in the game, the the English are given around about eight thousand, and the Normans uh, yeah, five yeah. and a half, five and a half thousand. Yeah, um, yeah. But obviously, you've on the got... basis that it's difficult to bring a large uh, a large army across the channel using effectively Viking ships uh, that that might be able to carry uh, fifty or so men, but uh, maybe a hundred or so men by the eleventh century, uh, and then horses. <laughs> you know, yeah. you're trying to carry horses as well. So yeah, that that sounds about right. Uh, yeah. You know, and the, and the other thing about the war game is it, it needs to, you know, there needs to be some way of balancing the forces as well. Of course, yeah, that's, especially when, yeah, well, as we will likely see uh, shortly when we dive into the battle, the the use of cavalry and the power of the cavalry and how they have uh, crafted a unique. Um, uh, in unique use for the cavalry as, as shock and impact troops um, in this game, which obviously uh, reflects fairly well as to their their role as well on on the medieval battlefield. But uh, there are some nuances to to how we'll be using them today as to 
compared to the historical uh, tactics that are employed. But we'll have a little talk about that uh, on the deployment as well. Good stuff. The Normans, Normans came from Vikings in France with Rollo, but uh, how did they go from being French dudes with some Vikings around to being their own thing as Normans? Um, yeah, this is this is one of those things that, uh, that historians love to debate and uh, love to address the the sort of way in which the uh, the, the Normans were different from the the French and uh, it partly comes about from uh, conflict with the uh, with the French crown and where the with the Duke of Normandy is it's like sort of pushing against the uh, the French king and where you get where you're getting um, um, a great degree of, of political friction uh, between the two and it's it's a way for uh, Dukes of Normandy to to be able to, uh, to sort of highlight their highlight their difference, and, and of course for the the French king in the in the 12th century, the the fact that uh, the you know somebody who was theoretically their vassal was also the king of a kingdom uh, was uh, you know was a bit of a slap in the eye, really. Uh, so I, I think that's part of the, the the kind of independence, the creation of independence, uh, or or an idea of independence. I think by the uh, by the Normans, many of whom were. Uh, you know, simply descended from the the French anyway, but uh, just happened to be in the the area of Normandy. Somebody was uh, just asking in the in the chat about whether it's uh, the what the French participation is in the in the Battle of Hastings, and and one of the things about the the Norman conquest is we're we're talking about it as Normans versus Saxons or Normans versus English, uh, but uh, some historians have have pointed out that effectively the Norman conquest is a a sort of Franco-Norman. Breton, uh, Flemish uh, sort of enterprise. So in, in, in many ways, there's, there's far more than just the, uh, the, the sort of Normans that uh, are, are taking part in the Battle of Hastings. But it's much easier just to remember it's the Norman Conquest, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there we, there go. we go. There we go. So he's prompting me. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm getting I'm, this. I'm, I'm going to have to probably have a have a have a dedicated Ryan Wookie soundbite at the end of this, so I can use that for uh, for, for future streams. The Yes, yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know, and, I, and then I'll be looking for a new job at that point. So. <laughs> my my employers uh, hear that so going live. I, I wonder if uh, if there are any of um, your your current students watching uh, um, if they're going to ask for. I'm uh, sure they'll let me know. <laughs> <laughs> we will uh, now switch into Field of Glory Two Medieval. Fantastic. So there we go. We've got ourselves all set up. I, I'm honestly really happy that this has all come together and worked so well, considering, you know, obviously we can't be together in, in, in the same room um, mm. and uh, you know, things as they are at the moment. But yeah, this is, everything so far is working wonderfully. So Field of Glory 2 Medieval, if you want to play this battle yourself uh, and uh, see, uh, see if you can do better or, or whatever happens, you go to Battles and then Epic Battles. The module you want is the Feudal North. And then as that loads in, we will then transition to a list of available battles you can play. There are also campaigns in this game. Uh, I recently recently played through the Antivin Empire uh, campaign series, which allows you to play through a series of historical battles, but also allows you to influence uh, kind of your historical path uh, down to your choices and how you uh, craft your army. But yes, Hastings. 1066 uh you have the normans and the english we're gonna be playing as the normans today um i think perhaps you can see um, a bit more variety doesn't it i think playing as the normans because that you've got the, the the sort of variety of of different uh different troop types and uh you know cavalry uh being involved and the english famously at the battle of hastings didn't use uh didn't use cavalry yeah yeah, by contrast, you've got a lot more of an infantry-focused um, army, but I think that goes to, as you discussed earlier, actually how quite uh, how impressive it was that they were able to bring across not only infantry, but, but cavalry as well in the numbers that they were able to bring on over, uh, considering their their tactics and their, their strategy of utilising that, that Norman cavalry to, to great effect. So, uh, obviously, you've got a little bit of information about Hastings, but I think perhaps um, as we dive into the... To deployment and just get set up uh ryan can provide a, a brief historical snap snapshot of uh of what we're what we're facing at 1066 between the normans and the and the english here 
Right. Okay. A, a lecture within a, a few seconds. Basically, we've we've got the uh, the Normans who are are, are kind of hold up on the uh, on the the south coast of England in, in Sussex, and um, they're they're trying to bring Harold uh, to battle. Harold had uh, had won a, a battle at Stamford Bridge, a resounding victory against uh, the Norwegian uh, ruler Harold Hardrada. Um, and, uh, basically, in any other year, that would have been a, a, a sort of major landmark moment. Uh, but effectively, Harold needed to to act quickly, otherwise he would lose face. And um, and they, the Normans are uh, kind of ravaging the area, destroying people, destroying people's lives uh, in the area where Harold actually owned property in the in the south of England. So it's it's about sort of potentially. You know, humiliating him and, and trying to bring him to battle perhaps faster than he ought to have have done. Harold stopped for a while in London to uh, to get some troops uh, together, and uh, in fact, one of the commanders in in this battle set up uh, here is the um, <coughs> excuse me the the leader of the the London uh, contingent uh, for for the English, and um, effectively. Harold may have moved quicker than William expected him to do. The the road up to London is is opened up to uh, to William, uh, but if William had acted too quickly, strategically, William was actually quite a cautious general. Actually, his his experience in in Normandy showed that he he was a, a cautious general, and and if William had, had gone too quickly to to London, maybe he his his kind of Route of escape might have been cut off or, or similar, so he needed he needed that uh, that decisive battle, and um, the uh, the English force under Harold are quickly lining up uh, along a ridge that controls the the path uh, the road up to London, and that's that's basically what the the Battle of Hastings is about. It's about this this control of this this important axis of movement, uh, which uh, uh, William needed uh, to to use and he's he's drawing up his standard uh, at the the top of uh, of Senlac Hill as it becomes known that's the uh, the Norman pun uh, bloody lake uh, is the, uh, the sort of French Norman pun uh, based potentially on an English place name uh, as well and um, and so you've got the, the the Normans being deployed at the bottom of the hill and, and trying to push their way up uh, up through the English line there. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, so we're now in the the deployment section of of the battle, uh, your force selection. We've also got the objectives uh, here. So to win a battle in Field of Glory 2 Medieval, there are two ways to do it. Either A, by routing at least 40% of the enemy's troops, but with 25% more casualties than you've lost, or just by routing 60% of their troops. So even if you got it, even if you lost 59%, as long as you push them over that 60% first, uh, you'll claim victory. We this is a turn-based strategy game, so we have uh, 21 uh, turns to see uh, if we can uh, push the push the English off the hill uh, or <laughs> draw them down from the hill and 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 break their army. But um, I know if I was the English, I wouldn't want to move off my nice defensive uh, position. Uh, one or two of you in chat saying, what is going on with the with the medieval art down the bottom? You've got a rabbit clutching, I believe, a shield and a rabbit riding on a snail. Um, yeah, there, there's so the a lot of interesting... Medieval marginalia is yeah. the, uh, the thing. It's, uh, you know, scribes have a, they had a bit of time on their hands once they finished writing the, the sort of main manuscript. Actually, you've got artists who are doing the uh, the, the additional bits in, in medieval manuscripts. Uh, so okay. I think that's, that's a sort of high Middle Ages kind of, uh, sort of. image. And uh, it's the opportunity for some, some wag to come at very high Middle Ages. <laughs> It's your Friday Friday afternoon doodles when you finish the main manuscript. <laughs> yes. Right. So, if we just take a look at the battlefield, we've obviously got the Norman troops um, at the bottom, and we have the uh, the English troops uh, arrayed sort of on this sort of tiered deployment uh, on the hills. They've got a line of um, well, they've actually got light archers and slingers. Um, deployed as their as their skirmishers and then you have well two central lines with a sort of a third line on the on the right hand side there uh, which makes this 
even tougher because not only if you break through that first line, you then are met with another line of spears, uh, another line of, of axes. And trying yeah. to, to, to break through is not just incredibly difficult in, in history, but also in the game as well. And uh, we'll be trying our best to see how we can try and maximize the use of all of our units. I mean, we basically got three types here. We have our, our own skirmish line, which is uh, a mix of light archers. And actually, we've just got one unit of light yeah. crossbowmen. Um, the light archers in general will be most effective counteracting the the enemy skirmishes, the slingers, whereas the crossbows, uh, we can I'll probably be using them against the, the more heavily armored infantry just to see if we get a lucky shot. If we, we happen to take down one of their generals, that can do quite a bit of damage to the enemy uh, cohesion to their morale. Uh, then our second unit type is uh, various spears, and we've got a couple of dismounted um, Norman knights. Um, as Ryan mentioned, the, the Normans is, is quite a mix of um, different uh different um uh, peoples and and um and smaller factions uh you've got the the bretons over on the left and uh over on the right you've got some flemish spearmen as well but roughly for the yeah. for the battle they're all all the spearmen are pretty much the the same yeah uh, i think some are from picardy as well actually which yeah, is we've northern got... france and We've got the Picard uh, yeah. knights and sergeants over on the far right. Yeah, and very so, importantly, Eustace of Boulogne, uh, which who was a, a, an independent count, uh, and he, he's portrayed on the the Bayer tapestry, and uh, sort of fell out with William after the Norman conquest. Actually, so I, I, he he was related by marriage to the the English royal family, and potentially had a bit of a claim to the the crown himself, even. Uh, so if, a bit if of a dodgy you, claim, but the if, old, he were to fall a in, if he were to fall in battle today, it wouldn't be the end of the world for William then. <laughs> 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 um, so yeah, and then obviously that third line, we have uh, a whole host of Norman cavalry, the knights and sergeants. Um, these are going to be incredibly uh, vital to how we play out the battle uh, as they were at Hastings itself, but uh, myself and Ryan discussed this a little bit before we started the stream today. Uh, my tactic is going to um, be a little bit different from what happened historically, and I'll let Ryan um, give a bit of a little bit of an overview of what happened historically. But to give a very brief outline of what I'm planning to do, um, we we do have a couple of extra points that we can spend to add in a few more units. So I'm just going to take a couple of extra archers at the front here because good idea. Yeah. My general Did you get a strategy. Chance for any... Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Carry. No, my general strategy is to try and shatter the center and and then separate the the structure of that that English line. If we can push them out to the flanks, we might have to you know we might concede at one flank or another. But if we can smash through their center. And in particular, because that right flank is so strong, because it's essentially got three lines at some at some parts of it, we want to go through the weakest part, which is the center. Uh, so we'll be moving up with the archers, counteracting their skirmishes. Uh, rather than then moving in with the infantry, I'm actually going to bring the cavalry up uh, in front to our first line and then just harass that English line of infantry because they have so much infantry here. Uh, before we can clash with our own, uh, who would easily be outclassed at the moment, we need to whittle them down. And the way I'm going to do that is with repeated uh, cycled cavalry charges to try and impact and cause not only uh, you know physical damage, but also sort of morale shock and, and drop the enemy um, morale there as well. But um, that's not quite how things played out historically. So while I just grab a couple more units of cavalry over on yeah. the left and the right and, uh, and play out the first turn... Uh, Take it away, Ryan. Yeah. So the um, with the with the battle, there's um, with the accounts of the battle. I mean, it's it's difficult to know exactly what happened, but uh, as a sort of generally reconstructed account of the battle has the um, uh, the infantry making the, uh, the the kind of first pushes against uh, 
against the English line, and, and potentially there, there may have been a lot more Norman uh, and and other French infantry at the the battlefield of Hastings than than cavalry, because of, of course the Bayeux Tapestry, our famous source, is done for a, a kind of high status audience, and uh, so they they're going to want to see cavalry, and the cavalry are a representative of victory as well in in medieval uh, battle art. So that that's going to be the stuff that gets the real uh, the, the real attention, and it's it, but it's I think pushing with the infantry and uh, shooting with the arrows as Lionheart is is doing here, uh, getting a a lot of uh, of good shots in uh, here. He's, he's going to have to be careful of the the hard going on the the left flank, which the the English seem to be using uh, to to basically secure their um, their right flank, which uh, seems to be historically the the case of the battle um shooting the shooting the archers uh shooting a lot of arrows uh at the english seems to have been uh part of the the strategy um for the for the battle or, or one of the tactics that's that's used i should say and um Obviously, it's not the best position to be at the bottom of a hill, shooting upwards using um, using uh, bows that aren't quite of the, the the kind of high standards that you get with the uh, the Welsh and English long bows of the uh, the later Middle Ages. Um, but you know they can still do a lot of damage. They can still disrupt a line. Um, I was reading in a a, a book uh, by French reenactors uh, last night and, and saying uh, that they they could pierce uh, male armor at fifty meters. They the, the kinds of uh, bows there. Um, I, I dare say that's debatable. But um, you know, sort of fifty meter distance seems about right. I, I don't know quite how they've uh, they've come to those uh, those those calculations i wouldn't yeah. like to think really um but uh, but yeah softening up the lines uh, the normans probably had crossbows as well actually the ballista is the the term that's used and uh, it's also a term that's used for these uh, giant counterweights um uh, artillery medieval uh, artillery as as sort of made famous in in the crusades but uh, it also can refer to a, a crossbow and crossbows could be a, a, a sort of effective uh, thing so we have uh, quite a, a significant somebody. Uh, somebody has got a, a, a purple arrow with a two four five. Does that deserve a Wookie raw lion hut? I, I think so. That's uh, Clicker Thank there you for go. the two hundred and forty five bits. Roar! Right there, there we go. go. I'm yeah. getting used to this. Um, so <laughs> I've never done a history lecture uh, interposed with uh, with Wookie roars before. Um, so we we. Kind of got that where the um, where they the uh, the Normans then start to use the the cavalry um, according to the accounts according to the various accounts, but that seems to follow a point where the uh, the the left wing of the uh, the the Norman line, uh, which is the the bit that's held by the the Bretons, seems to give way. Um, Partway through the the battle, and um, the the English at, at that side, according to uh, William of Poitiers account, and uh, potentially also according to an account uh, called the Carmen, the Song of the Battle of Hastings. I'm racking my brains to try to remember whether that is actually in that account as well. Um, but the the English pursue, they give up this prime position on the hill. Uh, or some of them give up the prime position on the hill. And William of Poitiers refers to them as rustics, rustici, uh, which kind of leads to the, the assumption that the English army are a, a, uh, include a, a whole lot of peasants with pitchforks who don't know what the hell they're doing. And um, that's, you know, kind of potentially doing them down, although there the may have been uh, sort of lower quality troops uh, wh who are, are being used to, to bulk out the, the army. Uh, my, my sort of historian's hat on it tends to, tends to run with the idea that, uh, that armies in the early and, and, and central Middle Ages tend to be made up of, of the nobility who want to sort of demonstrate that they're good warriors. Uh, but I think the thing is that part of the uh, the force gives way and that our uh, lovely cavalry then sort of realise that they can start pushing, eating up 
realize you know they they realize it of course they've known it all along that they can start pushing at the the english line in their little groups the the groups uh, probably of these uh maybe 10 to 20 uh warriors who've uh, train together go hunting together and um, basically live the high life in in normandy together or in uh, in picardy or, or wherever and they the the fighting in in what the uh, the norman french sources refer to as the this convoi uh the conroy uh, as we might say it in in english and um these these groups are, are are able to to basically eat at the line and potentially sort of um strike the English line here we have uh, uh, here's one of my examples I was, I was uh, looking forward to, uh, to sort of showing this I've got a bit of a time lag on my um, my display so it's taking a while to sort of see where, where we've, we've got this um, but yeah these, these um, cavalry troops potentially some of them using uh, the, the lance couched as well uh, in order to provide an extra shock and that they're well trained enough to be able to um, to to come back again to to be able to um, uh, to work as a small unit uh, and essentially these are kind of small unit tactics. Uh, the eagle-eyed amongst you might notice, oh, he's got the wrong sort of shield for the uh, the mid 11th century. Well, yeah, maybe um, the the shields on the Bayer tapestry have got these these shield bosses in the middle or, uh, and 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 are flatter. As well as somebody helpfully points out, the the Normans are eating off the shields uh, at the uh, prior to the battle as well, and uh, so they're using their shields as kind of tables. And uh, this this may be a sort of later 11th century sort of curved shield, but no, to my thinking, there's no reason why you can't have these these sort of curved shields as well. But the Normans are using these these kite shields, which originally emerge in uh, Byzantium, and uh, they they provide a protection of a whole side uh, of the uh, the rider against uh, any attacks and and what the Normans want to avoid when they've got their cavalry is they want to avoid uh, these kinds of guys the uh, house cars or house cars uh, who've got these these uh, big long axes uh, which can bring down a horse and its rider or a horse it doesn't really matter which in in this case and um, let's see if we can get a nice focus on that because I was, I was quite proud of that when I painted that many years ago. Don't get much time for painting these days. And um, these, these are the, uh, the, the Danish axes, the Dane axes of the, the kind of Anglo-Scandinavian royal household associated with, uh, with King Harold. Uh, King Harold was uh, basically... Um, got his his reputation from the uh, the anglo-scandinavian uh, court or rather his father had got his reputation from the anglo-scandinavian court he has many danish connections so uh, you've got these these kind of viking warriors uh, fighting with the, uh, the the english king at the time and they the thing about these these long axes on the the house cults and there are some on the the line here on the center of the line where harold has his standard is that um individually if somebody's raising an axe above their head to um, to attack an enemy, then they're exposing you know they're exposing the upper part of their body, so they need to be uh, well drilled. They need to be well protected by their by their colleagues, uh, by their comrades on either side of them, and and so you've you've got the um, you know basically the the sort of higher quality of, of troops need to be very well trained as uh, kind of elite warriors uh, at the time and and a large part of the rest of the the english line would be a uh, a wall of shields uh, here in this this game the the english are depicted as as having kite shields uh, just like the normans as we see on the uh, the images on the the bayer tapestry uh, but I think in the mid 11th century, you've got the um, uh, you've got the, the, the kind of round uh, shields which are, are still in use. Here's a couple of my my little uh, English uh, thanes. These are little plastic figures, um, and um, should be two of them. Oh yeah, there we go. I've got a, I've got a bit of a lag here. Uh, actually, that's French Air Force roundel from my spares box. I think. <laughs> so, <laughs> Please don't judge me on my uh, on, on my painting. Um, but 
effectively the the shields are just about big enough to be able to overlap um because of the size of the bases um they they wouldn't overlap here but the the overlapping of the shields allows the um allows the the, the spear which is the sort of predominant weapon of the 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 foot soldiers of the time or infantry we could call them in in wargamers language uh that's the the kind of predominant weapon and and that allows the the uh, the spears to kind of go through uh, the middle you know just just between the the spears and, and create what uh, in old english poetry is sometimes referred to as a as a kind of war hedge uh, lovely phrase the shield wall is the the other term which is uh, beloved of of poetry um I sometimes wonder how how effective they would have been at, at actually doing it, but I, I think uh, reenactors can uh, can tell us. No doubt, there's a few reenactors out there uh, will be able to uh, to tell us how 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 if you if you know your mates along the line, you'll be able to uh, sort of hold it together, hold it together against cavalry. And cavalry uh, horses don't like running up against people either that's the, the other yeah. thing is, that, is you know you're sticking a spear up in the air against uh, against cavalry you you know the, the horses have got to be pretty confident and yeah. uh, and and expecting the the infantry to to break so you know no matter how good these uh, these horsemen would be they're not you know they're not totally mad they would they want to be able to you know they they want to have a good chance of uh, being able of to break survival. through yeah. yeah, thankfully and in the in the game they've they've not heard of my uh, reputation of being a bit of a cavalry killer, um, yeah. which is I don't know if that's a help or a hindrance to the to the tactics. Uh, just to kind of jump in where we are mm. in, in game at the moment, we're we're three yeah. turns in. We've we've gone through the initial skirmish phase, and uh, we have one of our archers has been fragmented, so it's had its morale drop two levels. Um, so it is it is one more sort of devastating hit away from breaking and giving up uh, but that that's fine it's basically just taking me a few turns to get the cavalry into position to get ready to charge now the the plan with my tactic here is I've got to keep a clear channel for my cavalry to charge in but also to fall back if I move up the infantry too close to the cavalry they won't be able to pull back uh, from engaging the the enemy infantry because uh, left in prolonged melee they're really going to struggle um and also this slinger unit here is a little bit of a trap uh, for my cavalry because it's a very tempting target the stats are also saying i'm going to win brilliantly but if i if i attack them th because they're a light skirmisher unit they will just um evade and escape back behind their yeah. their their shield wall their their infantry line and then i will run into their spears and Sometimes you get a chance of the cavalry kind of pulling back, but most likely because we'll have moved uh, and used up all of our, our our movement points in the game, our action points, they they will be locked in combat for a turn. I should be able to get them out next turn, but I'm not sure I want to risk that just yet. So I'm still just maneuvering my cavalry forward, although I can do a couple of charges in. Whenever it's green on the impact, I'm just going for it because at this point I'm I'm not trying to conserve all the cavalry at the moment. I'm trying to just start sort of probing the... Um, the English line to work out if we can break through at any point. So it's just sending the cavalry in for charges. This one's led by a, a sub-general, so they're a little bit more effective, um, a bit more sort of, of, of an elite unit. But we've also got the enemy sub-generals, um, Eskar, Sheriff of Middlesex here uh, in Even, hmm. uh, and he's obviously giving quite a nice uh, solid buff to his yeah. units. He's got the, the Huskarls there. So we don't want to go charging into him uh, with, uh, with, their, with their axes there because they'll probably just lop off our heads. Um, so we're just moving down the line, keeping those channels behind the cavalry clear. In that, that case, we got a good impact, um, very little damage to the cavalry, because we, we, we will need these later on in the battle, because if we break through and we've got no one else to throw into the into the breach, um, it's going to be very, very short-lived. The problem we have now is we have these four uh, missile units in front, which are going to stop the cavalry getting through. So I need to clear out the, the slingers, and then I can follow up with the uh, with the Norman cavalry and uh, keep on hitting them. Mm, mm, yeah, yeah. Esgar there is. Uh, I, I, I like the, the the sort of historical names in in that. So he's he's Esgar. The, the he's referred to as the sheriff in in the game. Uh, he's he tended to be known in the 11th century as Esgar the or as Asgar or Esgar I think actually. Uh, Esgar the the staller. 
uh, which <laughs> could could lead to a bit of a judgment about him being a bit of a hesitant general. Uh, but a staller was actually the keeper of the king's horses, uh, so it's a really important uh, position to have. He was uh, descended from the the, the Danish uh, nobility, and um, his his father was an important uh, Danish settler in in Canute's England, and uh, so he he had a a sort of a high status position and he was the the leader of the um he he'd been responsible for bringing the uh the, the feud uh the anglo-saxon uh army uh the, the word feud is is used in old english uh from from london and uh, so had an important role in, in actually bringing some troops together we don't see many um archers on the english side do we lionheart as, as i recall no they have they tend to have mm. more slingers than anything else mm. um they've got a unit of light archers uh here in sort of the center left and uh, another unit of light archers over on the right and then the rest of them are all just the 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 slinger unit mm. um yeah yeah because I mean. i've yeah, I, I guess in in some ways that's that's probably from the um, representation in the in the Bayer tapestry where there is a single uh, English archer depicted on the uh, on the Bayer tapestry, and and in an account of uh, a, an Anglo-Saxon um, battle that took place at the end of the 10th century, the Battle of Molden, there's only one person who's, who's mentioned as as shooting bows, uh, shooting arrows rather. Um, uh, and, and in some ways, that that might reflect the, uh, the the kind of composition of the force. And and some historians have suggested that because Harold had moved very rapidly uh, after the Battle of Stamford Bridge at the end of uh, September 1066 and, and marched south uh, very quickly, some of the uh, the archers who would be less wealthy basically would would have been unable to um, to follow the army uh, because the the English army despite the fact that here the fighting uh, on foot would have been on horseback. Uh, so there'd be a whole load of horses back at the, you know, behind the line there, which, which isn't really depicted on the, uh, on the, on the battle here. That would be a bit messy. Um, but the, um, yeah, so, so there probably aren't as, as many archers and, and uh, William of Poitiers, for example, emphasizes the, the use of, of bows uh, amongst the, the Normans. Um, you know, I, I wonder maybe there may have been a, a few more. And there's a bit of debate as to whether a sling was actually used in battle as well uh, in the, the 11th century. But, uh, you know, they're, they're good fun. There's, a, a, there's somebody shown on the Bayer tapestry as throwing, uh, using a sling to throw rocks against uh, against birds who were attacking his, his crops. And uh, so this, this kind of character here, uh, with his his sling uh, is is always fun to, uh, to just kind of add a bit of uh, peasantiness to uh, to an Anglo-Saxon army of, of the period. Um, so yeah, so yeah, good. Oh, I did get that on the uh, the camera. Um, so so yeah, they um, they they're there and could potentially do you a bit of damage. And um, as as you say, Lionheart, but. Potentially, they're there as a bit of a trap uh, mm. for your uh, for your horses. Because I, I, you know, when I'm doing this, I, I've played this a, a few times. Um, played a few times with my son actually over the last couple of weeks. He tended to beat me actually, and um, I tend to go for the low hanging fruit, which just kind of means that uh, yeah, your your cavalry's kind of left exposed in in these cases. Yeah, we've made, so, we've made some good progress along the line. A couple of the the feud men are starting to uh, have their morale drop. The main thing is just, as I said, uh, I'm trying to keep these channels open so the cavalry can go in, hit the enemy, and then fall back uh, so that they can charge in again. Uh, mm. Otherwise, they'll get stuck in combat, and we will very quickly see Norman fortunes uh, not look so uh, so promising. Yeah, um, yeah. So just continuing to... I'm trying to flank round a little bit on the left, which is very... Risky, but considering the marshland there. But what I'm hoping is that I can keep the rest of the enemy engaged and focus on the the cavalry charges long enough to to then start pinning and, and locking down the uh, English infantry in exposed positions for the cavalry charges to then really unleash that that devastating flanking charge, which is going to be where uh, where the main sort of strength in the in the in the cavalry charge is going to lie. I think for this battle. Yeah, we have yeah. now managed to fragment this unit here. So we're, we're just starting to, to see gaps 
potentially start appearing, but considering the numbers of the the English involved here against us, at least in this scenario, um, mm. we're only scratching the surface at the moment. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed. It's, um, yes. What, what's the thing with the? Um, somebody had asked about uh, Harold's best course of action at at this point, and. Uh, I think that may have been Candyman, uh, as as one of your, your your people there had had asked the question as, as to whether Harold's sort of taking the the best co course of action uh, at uh, at what becomes the the site of battle, and um, probably it is he, he isn't in the strongest position. And um, if Harold didn't have enough cavalry, if the Normans uh, they had a lot of cavalry, then Potentially, that that may well have have been the uh, the, the strongest uh, course of action. Harold seems to be a more aggressive general, actually, than uh, than, uh, than William does in, in in some ways. So, potentially, William may have expected him to uh, may have expected Harold to do the aggressive attack, and in some ways, um, taking the the ridge at Hastings is is a strategically aggressive attack because it, it's sort of standing and making a, a stand that it, this is this is my kingdom and uh, it, it's kind of you know symbolically uh, showing the, the defense of the kingdom against an invader and um, that kind of symbolism in, in battles is is important and um, that's probably his best course of action for a force which uh, demands that he's showing uh, that he is the ruler and, and he needs to be seen to be the ruler in 1066. That's, uh, you know, that, that, that is part of what the, the, the whole politics is, is about here. So in some ways, you know, we're, we're thinking partly as war gamers here, but there also there's a whole sort of political aspect to this that Harold needs to be seen to be decisive otherwise he loses political capital in, in in 1066 and and so that is is part of what he has to do and the other thing as well is that these are blooming big armies for the day as well um okay six thousand eight thousand may not sound like a, a particularly big army but it's, it's a big army for the 11th century and uh maintaining that kind of cohesion is a, is a big thing so ensuring that you, you try to maintain cohesion on top of a hill uh, could well be uh, part of the strategy, you know, making sure that the banner, uh, the, the, the banner of Wessex, the dragon, as it's depicted on the, uh, the, the Bayer Tapestry, is, uh, is seen uh, by all the troops. And, and as long as that's flying, see if we can get that focus there, can it cope with the focus? Um, as long as that is, is seen, then it's, holding the the whole line together and maintaining uh harold's sense of uh his whole sense of kingship we have our first break um on the, on the left of the line which is which is great it's been led by uh, alan uh Fergent there uh he's charged on through uh with the breton knights and, oh we've got a name uh, right okay yeah so alan Ah, the Breton, right? Yes, yes, there is an, an Alain. So, I, when I was doing my recce earlier, I didn't spot an Alain uh, in doing, the, the names, but they're doing all right at the moment. The Bretons, we're we're a single point in percentage up, but I'll I'll take every every single percentage in this one. I think. Absolutely, yes. It's a slog, isn't it? Because the is. whole battle historically but, lasted a day. Yeah, so <laughs> Hopefully far. Hopefully, we'll be finished before then. <laughs> yeah, so far, the tactic is working. Okay, that the cavalry are starting to to take losses but i would say about 70 percent of the charges are are not just kind of hitting the enemy and bouncing back with equal casualties of four and fives we're actually getting some bigger rolls and getting larger hits of 12s and 16s when these infantry units are representing strengths of sort of 200 odd plus men that's actually leading to some fairly good results on the morale and once we can break through the first line the second line will look a little bit more scattered if they can't form up quickly enough. Um, so I'm just hoping that I can keep, that my cavalry keeps its morale up, keeps its cohesion together uh, long enough for me to keep hammering their line, but also getting my infantry ready to go into position to then lock down the the uh, enemy infantry. Because I believe 
probably next turn or the following turn, the uh, the English will start moving off their hill a little bit. They'll start trying to present a counterattack, uh, moving uh, their spears forward. So if I'm caught out then, that could lead to a fair bit of trouble. Mm. Mm. Yes, yeah. Will they come off that that prime position? Uh, that's the the thing, because the the thing about the the sort of scale, the uh, the ground scale of this game is that it's it because it had to be flattened in order to represent these uh, these units of um, you know where one of these uh, figures on the on the ground here is representing sixty warriors or so, sixty or so warriors. Um, the ground scale needs to be just flattened a little bit, or, or well, actually, it probably is sort of realistic in, in in terms of the the differences. But that that slope at the battlefield of Hastings was a massive slope. It, it was a you know very significant, and it, it had to be levelled uh, for the uh, for the abbey to be built built there. You can you can tell that I'm not entirely convinced by the uh, the arguments for other battle sites uh, for for Hastings, but. Uh, um, you know, partly because it's, it was so must have been so difficult to build Battle Abbey there uh, in the in the years after, and and so it's not an ideal position for for cavalry to be able to to come up and reenact us who, who do the Battle of Hastings uh, regularly, or at least they they used to be sort of thundering up the the slope or trying to thunder up the slope and and uh, they they say about how how difficult it is to to get up that slope on a on a horse and um you know i th i think the other thing though is that holding for the english holding that line is so important when the cavalry are thundering towards you at you know 60 horses together it really makes the ground shake and, and that's something which is, is seriously, you know, seriously worrying uh, for um, for a, a, a force that, that that's hold, held together with a, a shield wall. There has to be a, a supreme amount of self confidence to be able to uh, to manage to to hold that line against uh, against oncoming uh, oncoming cavalry. It's, you know, we're really talking about the, sh the shock of of cavalry here, and. Um, so that that's one of the the great things that the the sort of reenactments of the battle can can give us that 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 sort of sense of the uh, the ground moving as the the, the horses uh, come up the the hill there. So the Normans have got a difficult job, and the English have got a difficult job at, at this battle. Somebody mentioned the word uh, war of attrition in, in this, and it, it really does uh, seem to to be it. So Jordan. Two, two, uh, 274 or should I say 20,074 can confirm that slope is a killer reenacting in, in turn shoots uh, yes yeah, uh, yeah on the occasions I haven't been to uh, to the battlefield for um, a little while actually I, it would be nice to go again soon um, it would be nice to go anywhere soon wouldn't it <laughs> um, but, uh, but going there you know I tend to wear sturdy shoes uh, in order to, to tramp around and uh, you know 11th century shoes uh, must must make it very difficult to, to do so as well so thanks for that comment there um, so there was a Another question about whether flails uh, might be used in, in medieval battles, and, and that seems to be a sort of favourite of the computer games industry, doesn't it? Using using flails in battles. Like we won't flail. see any here. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We won't see any here. I don't know when it comes to the late Middle Ages. Or I think in um, in some of these uh, some of the the sort of tournament com combat, you know, potentially that that might be the case. Uh, but I think. People who are better versed in the, the late Middle Ages might be able to uh, to to answer that. Um, so, thoughts on the Abbey of whether this, the Abbey was actually built on top of the site of the battle, or more of the fighting took place on another part, on a hill at another part of the town. Yeah, they. Um, I I was wondering about uh, about that today because there is a, a an argument that uh, Coldbeck Hill, which is another kilometre north of uh, Sendlak. Uh, whether that was the the battlefield, and uh, there, there was a bit of toing and froing according to the Battle Abbey Chronicle, which is a 12th century record about when that uh, about where the the abbey might have been built. Of a, you know, sort of saying that this may or may not have been the best place to to build it, whether Senlac was the uh, 
possible and, and William apparently insisted that it be built there. Um, I think that the thing about the topography there at Senlac is that effectively that is the point that overlooks the, the ground as you have to move up uh, along this this kind of peninsula amongst marshy ground. Uh, so the, the ground around it on either side of this peninsula is quite uh, quite marshy. So you don't want to take your, your troops if you can avoid it uh, through the, the difficult going. And and that's that's really why Lionheart here is, is being kind of bottled up on this, this little peninsula. I notice he's, he's getting his, you know, sneaky flank movements in here, trying yeah. to outflank the English. Got some of the uh, Bretons over on the left and over on the right. They've actually all concentrated on sort of watching the cavalry charges come on in here. So I have three units moving up. We've got Flemish spearmen, uh, Norman dismounted knights and sergeants and uh, French armoured uh, spearmen. All moving in if they were to be attacked right now they're not in a very favorable position no, uh, especially no. from up on the high ground but what i'm hoping is that should the english try and push forward uh, and push back the the, the the cavalry charges and kind of close in my ability for, to just keep charging in and winding back up and charging back in uh, i'm hoping i can then flank on round and, and trap them from behind so that the the cavalry then have a field day by looking at the perfect target, which is the, the rear of any enemy <laughs> infantry yeah. already engaging another target. Uh, so yeah. it's 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 going. This is actually the best run I've had so far of this battle. Uh, oh, six turns stuff. in. We're at, we're at two percent losses for the Normans, but three yeah. percent for the English. There's only there's only one percent in it, but um, <sighs> there is more disruption across the the English line than than our own, hmm. and when when there is disruption uh and, and morale drops in field of glory 2 medieval uh the main impact is on the unit you're attacking but there is a, a chance that units around it their morale and their cohesion will also lower and drop so that's sort of this um kind of cumulative effect of constantly mm. doing these cycle charges just trying to not just break the unit in front of us but also those around it by seeing their their friends fall and and get sort of uh stampeded uh by the by the norman knights yes yeah i think morale is such an important element of uh, of the, the medieval battlefield i mean it's, it's such an important element of of any uh any military action um of course uh, but that that sort of sense that you know in the in the confusion of battle that sort of sense that you know 50 yards uh, to your left or 50 yards to your right is the line holding there are they going to be able to hold the line and and, and stop you getting surrounded by uh, you know these these nasty horses who might come come around at any point and, and attack you uh you know when you're at your part point of the line if your comrades are, are falling alongside you then that's going to affect your morale but also the sort of sense that you might just catch, you know, from the from the uh, the, the kind of uh, side view. Uh, your peripheral vision might just sort of catch the, the sort of sense that something's happening. Uh, you know, a banner, one of the other banners, one of the banners of a unit might be falling, and oh my god, you know, that that sort of sense of of, uh, of fear uh, is it must be so significant. Uh, so. The banners here are a little bit artificial, actually. They, they're showing the banners of, of Wessex here, the, the, the dragon of Wessex uh, being depicted. But there is a there is a depiction on the the Bayer tapestry of uh, this this kind of uh, banner, this this Wessex banner uh, being uh, being used by by the English when Harold uh, famously fell at the end of the uh, the Battle of uh, Hastings. I, I haven't mentioned with the arrow in his eye um that the banner is depicted as as falling with him and and so what you'd have is a royal banner but you'd also have the different contingents uh with their banners as well it's really interesting there's lots of words in old english for banners uh being uh, being used by uh, by early medieval armies and um it was only a few years ago that i i sort of looks uh looks up uh, different references to uh, to banners and, and it just really surprised me how many words there are for it but we don't tend to think of early medieval armies as having all these these banners we just tend to think of like you know the main leader having a banner but uh, 
uh, but I, I think with an army of uh, you know 8,000 or so, there'd be a lot of them. And uh, the Normans, they, the, the use of these sort of individual pennons on the, the ends of the, um, the lances uh, would also be giving us a sort of sense of unit identity and unit cohesion for the, for the cavalry as well. Uh, so, and the other thing is blowing horns as well, uh, in order for the the battle to uh, to kind of have a sense of you know to know what your what your comrades are doing. You can't really shout very well, so blowing a horn uh, is is probably a, a sort of effective uh, thing to do as well. I think that's um, something that playing historical strategy games like this that you uh, yeah you, you kind of you don't quite get the importance of the use of banners and, and pennants and horns uh, everything to coordinate a battle because here we're playing as you know the, the sort of top down god's eye view we can see the whole battlefield we know what's happening on left to right and center all in one sweeping look mm. and the fact that uh, armies were able to um, effectively maneuver and react when they were you know hundreds of meters uh, apart from one another, if if not, you know, further in in some larger engagements and uh, syncing that all up to be an effective strategy, uh, mm. we have now reached turn seven. So the uh, the Anglo Saxons, the, 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 the English, have charged off the hill a little bit, um, but they're still holding that defensive position uh, because they had two or three lines deep uh, and reserves. So. We are actually doing okay. That we are still two percent casualties, but the English are at five percent, so we're we're three up on them. Um, we've got a little bit of problems with our with our strategy for for the next couple of turns, in that we need to secure those channels for the cavalry to charge in and pull back again because we've now been compressed. Um, everyone that was behind is is now a couple of ranks forward again. So, such as my my cavalry here are now right in the thick of it, and they're really going to struggle. Um, mm. Although we can try and drive them out, we've got to stop the archers at this point. Just because uh, I think, I mean, historically, it was in the later stages of the battle they were sort of uh, firing up at yeah, higher extremely arc effective, shots. yes. But in Field of Glory, once a unit is engaged in in melee, that you cannot then be targeted by um, by <laughs> archers, which is probably a saving grace for friendly fire. Um, yeah. But um, it does mean that unless you can get them round to the flanks to engage mm. or get a clear line of sight across a, a massive infantry melee, at this point I'm going to be pulling them back and, and not worrying too much about them because the, 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 the core strategy is still to secure the, the channels for my, mm. for my cavalry to, to, to charge on in uh, and try and continue to break through. Uh, although we've got we've got um, Harold uh, Goldwinson charging on in here now he's uh, he's thrown his unit of Huskulls right into the into the mix there uh, up against oh. uh, Alan. So um, well, yes, yeah, that, that's the thing, isn't it? With a, a leader, you know, taking on uh, an enemy leader in order to to be able to cement their reputation as as far as possible. So you don't you know you don't want to be seen to be turning down a fight if. Uh, if, if you're there, you know that 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 may well be part of our our sort of AI Harold's uh, thinking here. To uh, might to, be living up, to, as you on. said, to the slightly yeah. more aggressive um, commander role. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah. The thing about the uh, the arrows being shot over, you know, shot shot up in um, um, in, in quantity. I, I do wonder whether that's William of Poitiers. Uh, Who's this? This kind of apologist for uh, for Duke William and King William, uh, whether he's sort of using that to create a narrative for the day because it, it tells a lovely story and it very much pans out as uh, William being basically a latter day Julius Caesar, and, and William of Poitiers kind of owes a lot of his uh, his Latin to uh, to Caesar's accounts of the uh, the conquests of the Gauls and the Britons. So I think he's he's trying to to kind of show it, show it like that. Uh, yeah. Talking of Britons, the Bretons uh, from, from Western France seem to be holding up very well 
in in this one. And uh, it it kind of struck me as I was saying that about William of Poitiers that uh, that kind of blaming the Normans, blaming the Bretons for the uh, the loss of of part of their line. Uh, it may also be part of the the kind of storytelling. Uh, of the the narrative of the the battle and and it, it kind of makes a, a great drama uh, for the 11th century um, Norman nobility and you can kind of imagine the the bio tapestry being used almost as a kind of giant film strip uh, for the the Norman nobility to kind of tell the tale of the uh, the Battle of Hastings and and at some point I don't know if we we kind of reached that where you know some of the Normans need to be rallied and um, on the Bayard Tapestry quite famously William takes off his uh, his helmet and uh, you know, potentially I have this this is actually uh, I think a, a crusader figure uh, of a of a leader um, a kind of uh, figure without his helmet I, I all I sort of painted this and I realised this this does quite nicely for uh, for Duke William. We don't know whether he had blonde hair or not, of course. Uh, but, uh, you know, that, that sort of figure with his, you know, lifting off his helmet to, to show that he's alive. Uh, and there's this, this moment in, in William of Poitiers' account where, where he's, he's kind of rallying the, the troops. And on the Bayer Tapestry, they've got uh, William's uh, brother or half-brother, Bishop Odo of Bayeux, uh, of course, it's the Bayer Tapestry, uh, showing this, um, showing this, this rallying, playing this important part in the, uh, in the rallying of the, uh, the troops there, and um, bishops uh, could well be uh, military leaders in their own right, and um, that, that kind of idea of bishops not being able to to shed blood or, or using or rather using a sorry I should say using a mace so that they didn't shed blood is a bit of a, a, a Victorian myth actually uh, bishops shouldn't really shed blood but I think they're, they're, you know, in, they're, in this if they're stuck in they're going to give it a go as well <laughs> potentially yes yeah so uh, Odo is depicted in armour you know he's, he's one of the uh, the troops and the the mace is is a uh, I have a staff of office basically showing uh showing that he's in command so my my little william the conqueror figure should really have had a, a kind of staff of office uh to to show his his kind of authority so um yeah the question about the bretons um somebody had asked ages ago about the breton contingents at the at the battle so uh, those of you who are uh are, are kind of nicely sending in questions uh, i am trying to uh, uh trying to answer those those questions as we as we go through um but uh yes uh i doesn't it seem that it was more planning with, with troops for the eventuality of a of a rear uh, a rear charge so the candy man asking a, a question about whether there's planning for for this i, I think in, in many ways that's what they're intending to uh, intending to do that's the uh, the thing that um, so, yeah, is it? Would it be okay of me to to just ask uh, answer a question asked asked by Ghost Boy about the the impact of the the loss of culture after the uh, yeah sure the, the, the Battle of Hastings because that that sort of sense of English loss I, I think that that sort of Definitely. sense of loss was felt uh, pretty keenly and. Um, a, uh, a historian, Cam uh, a Cambridge historian, um, Elizabeth uh, Van Hoots, uh, argues, uh, gosh, it might have been about 20 years ago, she actually uh, wrote a, a paper about the, the impact and the trauma of 1066 for the English, that there is this, this kind of... Nobody writes about it, basically. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle kind of poodles along, basically, but there isn't a kind of reflection on this, and there is a kind of sense of not wishing to to reflect on it and then at the end of the 11th century early 12th century uh, there's a new generation of, of people who are willing to to write about it and try to analyze it and people who, uh, who may have some Norman ancestry as well as English ancestry and, and are able to to kind of comment on on this on the um, and and almost assess it in a um, in an analytical fashion, in a 
almost a dispassionate fashion, not completely dispassionate by any means, but, um, you know, trying to sort of get that, that sense of the loss of culture. And then there's this outburst of historical writing in the 12th century when writers are, are trying to make sense of what has happened. And we then might have you're spoken kind of... a little bit too soon about the Breton Knights. They've just started to break. <laughs> oh, dear. Right. Okay. Well, they've, they've got been, a pretty hard They've job. been surrounded. I think the... The, the sort of the change in the, in the in the tactics now with the with the English pushing forward uh, previously where we were just being able to hit them head on and not having to worry about being hit on either side from the from flanking attacks now that they've sort of thrown caution to the wind and, and aren't too worried about keeping that solid spear line they're able to get in at these these angles and these flanking attacks that have unfortunately pushed back uh, Alan at the moment he's uh he's he's sort of wavering at the moment another another big attack on him could break him Okay. But, uh, so so far, I think those initial charges we did with the cavalry have have stopped the uh, English infantry from being as effective as they would have liked to have been. They've uh, they've taken enough casualties that when they do try and counter charge into the cavalry, uh, they're actually taking some pretty hefty casualties and and probably having a fair bit of regret about charging into to mounted uh, mounted knights. Hmm. Yes, yeah, that's that's part of the uh, part of what happened at the at the, at the battle, um, that the the sort of sense of um, you know running down the hill after the, the the cavalry, or well, the cavalry and any dismounted, presumably any dismounted uh, cavalry, any people who'd lost their mounts or, or whatever, uh, or any infantry who may have been mixed in amongst them, um, you know, the exhilaration of running. Running after the uh, the apparently retreating enemy must uh, must have been too tempting for for, for some of the the English line uh, in in that example. Uh, but it's it's interesting that uh, the, you know your your left part of the uh, the line has uh, has kind of fallen back, and hopefully you'll be able to uh, to you know, yeah. hopefully you'll be able to to get that that part of the line back. Uh, we should be able to. I think again with the with the keeping those channels open for the cavalry, they've been able to reform. But this is yeah where the the, the biggest hit to our our forces has been over on that left. We've been bogged down in the marsh, so we can't flank. They've you know, they didn't have to. They've actually only uh, thrown their slingers right up against our, our armored spearmen. So these these fairly proficient elite infantry, because they're in this uh, in in this heavy armor, the slingers are making short work of them in the marsh and have mm. locked them down so have effectively taken out one of my one of my better infantry units out of play mm. and uh, the rest of the cavalry is now starting to lose those channels so they, they can't uh, counter as they once did yeah. still trying to, to punch a hole through somewhere yeah that hands. seems to be the uh, the the aim of the game, he's, doesn't it? He's really, lost, he's lost half of his unit so far. He's, he's had a pretty terrible time. <laughs> <laughs> See, my my problem when I when I play the game is is not necessarily keeping as good an eye as as I should have been doing on how much of a unit there was left after uh, after attacking. So it's you know that that sort of sense of of needing to keep an eye on you know, how how much unit is there even though the banner might still be there are there enough uh, troops under the banner to, uh, uh, to 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 be fighting there uh, so somebody had asked about the uh, the church's attitude to the crossbow and the use of the crossbow in the, the middle ages and um, it's at the um the lateran council of uh, 1139 bans the the use of the crossbow um uh, but apparently it also bans use of other missile weapons as well. It's just we tend to focus on the crossbow. Um, but the, the, the sort of big danger uh, for the crossbow in warfare, which was kind of focused on asserting the status of these warriors and uh, where, where they're able to sort of get this affirmation of, of themselves through being able to fight other people of a similar class, is that if, if people come along with a crossbow, which has a far better... Uh, armor piercing and uh, in 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 one case Lionheart's uh, killing capability indeed um, that it's that kind of danger that uh, that, that must have um, really annoyed uh, the the medieval nobility so uh, 
also um, um, mercenaries seem to have uh, used crossbows because mercenaries are, are people that you you pay and this this particularly becomes apparent in the 12th century where there are these um more frequently warfare in the uh by the by the 12th century or even in the 11th century it takes part uh, uh takes the form of sieges rather than pitched battles like this one so the crossbow is is far more um lends itself far more to that that kind of static action where somebody can have a crossbow ready with the uh with the bolts in the in the crossbow and can be ready to to take a shot if somebody should uh, kind of present their head above the uh, the parapet uh, as indeed um, Richard Coeur de Leon, uh, Lionheart's namesake, uh, found out to his cost in uh, in 1189. Uh, so that's the thing, you know, these these people who uh, who use these these sort of deadly weapons that, that kind of break the rules of war in some cases. That uh, there are sometimes uh, there's sometimes a bit of disapproval against that that kind of thing. I should say, I think um, we had a redeem for um, a, it was a. Use the sword, I believe. We had a little while back, um, which I have um, a, a replica of Gandalf's Glamdring um, oh, wow. sword. Right. And uh, for a certain number of channel points, I will give it a uh, ceremonial waggle for victory. And I think, I think it, we we've earned it. We're we're nine percent ahead. We've lost three percent of our force. The English have lost twelve percent. And. Um, I think it all came down to getting those key charges into the center of the line because that's where the most disruption is if we sort of try and pick out Norman from English right now. Uh, the left and the right are fairly solid line positions still, but the center is, a, is an absolute mess of cavalry and infantry. But as long as we're keeping the spacing and those channels open, the cavalry can keep on charging on in uh, repeating those high impact cycle charges and uh i i i won't i won't call it yet but i think we're on the right path to um to oh, Norman conquest yeah, yes. here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah you better not call it uh just yet but of course you know for for william uh he's he's trying to sort of evoke that sense of righteousness he had a banner from the pope uh for the for the battle uh, at least they make a lot of that after the battle uh probably would have made less of it had they lost the battle but that sense of uh of prayer and piety would also have been uh, part of that 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 sort of expectation of winning as would have been the case for the english as well uh, and so you know that that was the case for for harold harold was a, a conventionally pious figure uh of the the 11th uh, century he, he he made um bequest to Waltham, Waltham Abbey just north of London and I, I wonder if uh, Harold sort of on his way down to London may have stopped at, at Waltham in order to, uh, to to get a blessing for the battle to come as well and and so that that sort of expectation that that uh, sort of sense of being right uh, is, is part of the the whole thing about a, a battle in this period so so yeah it was probably worth bringing the, uh, the the sword out at that point there yep. fine heart but we'll <laughs> we'll save the actual throwing it up in the air and catching it uh, maybe for, the, <laughs> for later check, on check the mark on the ceiling <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a feature of the house now <laughs> see <laughs> so this this is where i'm glad i'm not in the same room <laughs> yeah, yeah, it'd be a bit dangerous there we go So the the English have have come down off the hill, haven't they? In this, yeah, we sort of got setting. these three tiers, and we're now there's still a little bit of of, mm. of hilly hilly ground where the Norman deployment starts for this scenario, but they mm. are especially through that. I mean, that center, there any sense of real uh, formation, bar a couple of units standing shoulder to shoulder. There's there's gaps appearing all over mm. the place, and actually a couple of the the cavalry units are now puncturing well through two or three lines deep um mm. which which can can be a blessing and a curse because then they're isolated at rest away from the rest of their support but um 
yeah, the the English have really come on down, uh, mm. especially off off Senlac Hill. They've take they've come off the high ground of, of in the game. It gives it a a point of of three hundred height. Um, so yeah, it's three hundred to two hundred to one seventy five as it as it comes mm. down. So yeah, they've had that consistent height advantage for quite a considerable amount of time, and I think they uh, you know decided that. Perhaps they'd, they'd endured enough cavalry impacts and they wanted to start trying to break break that up or, or close down those those charging channels that I'd been creating. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so it's... Uh, you know, the, the confusion of battle, I think, is, is one of the things here. And it's... it's it's quite uh, quite fun here that you're 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 having to move really quickly. You're having to make really quick decisions as well, and in, in, in this setting, Lionheart. And one of the things about a big uh, kind of war game like this is that there's a lot of pondering and 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 thinking and sort of thinking things through. The sort of tabletop war game, or indeed if you're playing this out in a more leisured environment, this this kind of battle could uh, you know could be played out over a much longer length of time. But uh, it's it's really got that boom 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 you know that that that, that kind of sense of needing to keep uh, keep pressing forward and uh, yeah. really taking the you know keeping the initiative against the uh, against the enemy there. I think knowing that I've got uh, a turn limit too, we're nearly sort of halfway yeah, through yeah. The, the turns as well. I want to, I mean, we if we if we get lucky and we keep. Uh, avoiding any serious casualties, we should be able to go for that that first victory objective, which is to rout forty percent of the the enemy force. Uh, as long as we don't take more than twenty five percent casualties, we might even be able mm. to sort of. It would be they'd still have a fair sizable force, but their their will to fight, their morale is is so mm. broken by this point that um, you know, p perhaps a by that point an arrow may end up in a in a certain king's eye and and uh, yes. yeah. <laughs> lead to a lead to a, a solid rout of the of the english forces but um yeah yeah indeed so that that's the thing isn't it when um a battle is so reliant upon um uh, upon the the personality of, uh, upon the the leader surviving and, and sort of holding on and showing that they are in control. And uh, so that has a morale basis, that has a, a, a morale benefit while they're alive. But, you know, once they're off, that's it, you know, that, that's it really. Um, and no matter how much uh, the, the kind of poetry of the period might praise those who carried on and fought once the leader had died. So Beowulf for the Battle of Molden poem. You know, I think the reality is that that the uh, the large majority cut and run, and uh, that I, th I think may well be the case at the, the Battle of Hastings. The arrow in the eye, by the way, um, could be could be a myth. I don't want to sort of burst yeah. too many people's uh, <laughs> bubbles and, and expectations, but we still talk about the arrow in the eye because it's just such a, a sort of evocative thing. It may even have been added to the the bio tapestry. I think there is. Uh, sort of suggestions that uh, at some point in the early modern period it may have just been re-embroidered in order to kind of make sense to, to fit with one of the uh, the 12th century accounts of the battle where the, the arrow in the eye is, is used as this, uh, this this kind of image in the story and then you know somebody helpfully corrects the the bio tapestry at, at, at some point uh, but there are there are scholars who spend their whole lives studying the bio tapestry and looking at the, the the very details the sort of intricate details of the bio tapestry so i'm i'm sure somebody could uh, could correct me if, if necessary um somebody had had asked a question about sieges uh and and um, didn't write down the the name uh, of the, um, the the person who who'd asked the the question about sieges, whether sieges are really where wars are are fought in the Middle Ages, and and certainly in this period in the Central Middle Ages, um, and we see this with with William that he's uh, prior to 1066, he's undertaking campaigns which are, are ravaging the countryside, as I said earlier, ruining people's lives, and um, and also besieging towns, besieging castles, those who rebel against him, those who rebel against him are using their, their castles as, as a, their kind of bulwark. And, and sieges kind of morph a little bit into battles 
at times like the Battle of Tangesprey uh, in Normandy where uh, Henry I fought against um, his, his brother Robert Curtis in 1106. That's essentially a siege that kind of steps into a battle as, as is Lincoln in 1141 during the so-called anarchy uh, of the, uh, the reign of, of King Stephen. And in a sense, in a way, you don't, you know, we, we kind of have an idea of a of the army being entirely enclosed within a, a within a fortress and, and sort of being entirely holed up. But actually, a siege might consist of, of um, sallies forth out of the um, you know, out of the, the defensive works and um, you know where it's where it's not possible to entirely surround a, a fortress. You get this more static form of warfare, and sieges probably are the more successful strategy um, overall, either withholding a, a besieging army or, or managing to withhold um, or, or being able to, to take a fortress. Um, but they require, a, well, I was going to say they require a lot more investment. <laughs> Actually, the, uh, I guess the logistics and the supplies. Are, yeah, uh, there's logistics, and but of course there's logistics and supplies for a battle, as well. But a battle can give you a quick result, and yeah. and in, in this case, this is, you know, effectively where you've got this this kind of situation. Like at Hastings, there aren't that many battles in in this period actually, um, but a battle can give a decisive result, and that's where, in a situation where William can't necessarily sort of undertake the the actions that uh, that Sven Fortbeard or indeed Canute had done in the uh, the early 11th century of kind of wearing away uh, at the the south of England and sort of moving around with uh, sort of mobile raiding armies um, that that William is is needing to sort of force this this decisive uh, decisive battle. Mm. He chose, as I say, uh, a bit more cautious than than Harold, and really chose the opportune moment to to, to strike and to, to to fight this mm -hmm. battle. It was, you know, hoping that this could be the decisive sword stroke of his campaign. Mm -hmm. um, if, if I'm not mistaken, he didn't immediately then march on to London following um, Hastings. He, he had, yeah, he had a bit of yeah. time, so it was almost uh, he, he did take his time to consider his options. Um, yeah. uh, whereas Harold, by contrast, potentially could have considered mm. taking his time to, to, to march south, but instead decided that, as you said before, this, this almost symbolism of defending the path to London to... Um, to 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 defend the the, the kingdom yeah. there was uh, of greater importance than actually a, a, a fresher mm. force. Yes, yeah, yeah. That that need to um, to to sort of face William down, um, but of course from um, from William's perspective, as you say, after after the the battle, William still had to sort of move around and um, didn't seize the kingdom until uh, December 1066 uh, because there were plenty of other people who, who still opposed him in, in different places. Um, but it was it was basically at Hastings where you have the coordinated resistance to William. And uh, then uh, elsewhere, well, they, the, the people of London uh, seemed to support Edgar Aetherling at, at that point, who was this, uh, this, this the son of a... Um, a, a former exiled prince from the uh, uh, from the English royal family, and uh, they th that's basically what made 1066 not the year of three kings, but actually a year of four kings, uh, with Edgar Atheling being uh, being declared king by the people of London, <laughs> and so Williams, you know, got a decisive victory, but he still hadn't taken the whole and kingdom after, after the, the kingdom. battle of Hastings. Well, the, the Bretons are rallying. At there last. you go. Um, right. Alan is, is back. Um, he's still a bit shaky, but he is back. We are. We've had some some light archers that were earlier sort of sacrificed into the melee to to try and tie up the the English advance. They've now turned back to the fight, and their uh, cohesion is um, is uh, a little bit restored. Uh, God, the, the right is a mess now. The the cavalry have, have pursued the enemy 
uh, through the lines uh, with uh, little care for what the overall formation should have been. So we now actually have a pretty much non-existent um, right flank, apart from these these guys uh, coming round to try and flank right from behind. But we we have a big old hole uh, in the battle line. But the, I think there's enough uh, enough cavalry stuck in to still um, draw. Uh, the English's uh, attention for, for a little bit longer until we can punch through with cavalry again. Mm. Yeah, sorry, I'm just uh, taking a, a look at, uh, at the, the whole setup and uh, trying to make sense of the, the whole thing here. Uh, the Normans have, have got their banners, actually. They've got their, um, their leopards. Uh, which is a kind of it's, it's a sort of 12th century i think we know about it from the 12th century that uh, that heraldic device for the normans i don't know if there is specific evidence of, of that in the uh, in the 11th but it makes it a lot easier to distinguish them <laughs> with these, these red banners yeah. yes yeah you can imagine the amount of uh, dye being used to to make those massive banners uh, you know in, in in real life i always wonder if uh sort of if if had i had i been alive in this time whether a, a profitable career choice would have been a a, a dyer or a, or a banner or, or pennant maker for yeah. for all these armies um uh, yeah yeah potentially you'd have to um produce a lot of urine uh, in order to <laughs> <laughs> in order to fix the dyes uh, within the within the cloth uh, so you know dyers and anybody involved in the cloth industry would have been a very stinky business within a, a, a medieval settlement so of course you wouldn't necessarily have to, uh, to to use all the all the wee yourself or provide all the wee yourself <laughs> that's why you do it within a settlement <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, there's somebody who's actually um, some, there's a, um, a, a professor Bernard Backrack who's who's done these wonderful calculations. Uh, he's, he's kind of made a career of making all these these calculations, uh, and uh, he he did these calculations of the the Norman army and and what that would have required. Uh, I I think he he kind of probably overestimates the size of the Norman army as, as they were in Normandy before they set off uh, for England. But he's he actually calculated the amounts of, uh, um, of of horse poo and horse wee that would have been produced uh, by the, the army and how much it would have, uh, have taken. Uh, excuse me for not using the uh, the, the appropriate uh, old English words for, uh, <laughs> for that, but I, I kind of realised that you you know that there may be uh, pupils, uh, school pupils, uh, viewing this potentially. But um, there is, you know, there's this sort of wonderful calculation about the the number of uh, tons of um, ho horse waste and uh, uh, that, that's produced, and and then what that would have required to keep the the camp clean and healthy and. Um, Prof Bacharach's uh, arguments is that, are that the Normans were using uh, Roman military manuals uh, in order to, to, to kind of uh, keep their, their army so, so well, um, so well organized. But it's, it's basically a kind of neo-Roman army in, in many ways. I, I, I'm not sure I would necessarily sort of argue that the Normans were kind of a, a, a sort of neo-Roman army, uh, but uh, it, it must have taken a huge amount of logistical organization, I, I think. Uh, you know, we are grateful to, to Prof Bacharach for, for making those, those calculations because it kind of allows us to, uh, to, to use occasional um, rude words in, in, in lectures when the, <laughs> the occasion takes. Um, so yes, I'm, I'm very proud of myself for keeping my language uh, clean in, in that case. Um, so goodness, right? Okay. Um, just having a look at uh, other questions. There was a question somebody had asked about the survival rate of infantry when uh, when basically things are things come to a melee. Um, I think it it's or or even a you know a sort of out and right out and out. Bush, basically, I, I tend to sort of think of the melee as the, the sort of um, the scrapping, and then the, the, the overall fight as well. But melee is the, the sort of scrap itself, isn't it? Um, but the the survival rate of, of infantry in in these cases, um, I think that's where we have the the benefit of uh, 
mathematics for for thinking about these these kinds of things and and you know trying to calculate these uh, these these kinds of issues and um, in, in some cases you know maybe um, uh, you could tell I don't actually know the maths here um, but it, it's possible to be to be thinking about these sorts of things because it depends on how long the line holds for how long the line holds up for or, or whether it breaks and uh, you know that individually your survival is likely to be higher but you know your your comrades survival is is going to be a lot less and uh, are people necessarily going to be able to take those um you know make those calculations themselves that they're, they're not thinking i have a one in ten chance of survival here they're, they're you know they're thinking uh, i've survived other battles i can survive this one or or maybe oh my god uh, you know let's let's run away here in in some cases and the survival rate might vary very significantly depending on how much experience the warriors had one of the things that said about the the english at hastings is that they weren't uh, basically match fit uh, for the battle or they weren't match ready because they didn't have enough experience of, of fighting other battles whereas the Normans had been uh, in various campaigns in the 1050s and even in the, the 1060s so they knew uh, about the, the, the kind of nature of cavalry warfare um, in some ways that's not quite true because Harold had been campaigning in Wales uh, during the, the 1050s so had some you know some experience as a as a commander and of, of course you know you don't win the battle of stamford bridge uh, without some experience as a as an army um or as a as warriors although some would point out that the english won the battle of stamford bridge because they cheated and caught the uh, the vikings when they were napping uh and when the uh, the Vikings didn't have their armour, but I think in order to to make that judgment, we rely on uh, quite a late source uh, to to make that uh, that particular judgment. Uh, so, survival rate of infantry. You know, I'm holding my hands up here. Uh, you know, maybe play the game and, uh, and try to work it out. From See the, how the well you do. Yeah, how many do you yeah. have left at the end? There yeah, are, there are, yeah. The game does give you some pretty, some pretty good kind of uh, after-action uh, reports and stats that you can, you can yeah. go through it all. Um, yeah. It does give you a, a some... good idea of crafting these, these, these uh, scenario battles. Yeah, there's, there's some serious thought that's gone into the, uh, you know, thinking about the, the, the kind of survival rate probabilities and, and things like that. There's a certain amount of, of, of um, game ability that, that's also gone into the calculations, of course, and I, I think we do need to uh, to make that clear uh, yes. as well. I mean, you can have a look at the, the, the combat log um, in terms of those that like to get really stuck into the details. We can see all the all the modifiers, things like taking into account the proximity of, of nearby units that are affecting their cohesion and, and seeing what is mm. leading to specific results in in combat. Um, so yeah, if you like a, a deep mm. dive, the yeah. game gives you the tools to to you know to play it as I guess as casually or as um, almost brutally efficiently as as you want to with with as much information as you can as you want to take on board basically. Yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely, and and it's uh, one of those ways of sort of analysing whether the uh, the dice used by the computer were uh, were cheaty dice or, or not. How, so, how loaded, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how loaded the dice were. Yes, yeah, indeed. Um, yeah, there was a, a a question just come up about whether a a minstrel had really struck the first blow uh, for the the Normans in the in the battle and. Um, that's a, a lovely story that's told by a um, uh, gosh, what is it? he's from Jersey, uh, the Channel Islands, uh, a, a character by the name of Wass or Wace, as we say it with, a, with, an, with an English accent. Um, so Wass was uh, was writing in Normandy in the later 12th century, and he tells this story of a of a character by the name of uh, of Taillefer or Taillefer, um, which something like carry iron or something like that is the, the, the name and they have him juggling uh, in, in front of the battle while reciting the, uh, the the story of the Song of Roland which is the great chivalric epic uh, of the, the Middle Ages and um, whether or not that's, that's true but the, the name you know the, the, 
there's a historical name, but it's it's a later generation uh, name. The Carmen of the the Battle of Hastings, which may be written within a very short space of time. Uh, the Song of the Battle of Hastings also um, mentions uh, the. I, I think it says about the recitation of the um, uh, the the Song of Roland. It says it may even say about Talifer as well, Talifer uh, as well. Um, but that that idea of somebody stepping out in front of the line uh, and and kind of giving giving heart to the rest of the troops, ooh, it's one of those things. Is it a, a kind of literary creation, or would it actually have represented a, a real battle? I'm, I'm you know, medieval audiences knew the story of David and Goliath, for example. You know, that's a well-told epic of the Old Testament. Uh, for for medieval audiences and uh, that you know they'd, they'd be aware of that and um, you might also say from the the account of of the Battle of uh, Stamford Bridge of somebody holding the bridge uh, against the the enemy as kind of champion holding the bridge um, there's a there's a kind of sense of, of truth about it the idea of striking the first blow uh, and getting away with it and surviving. You know, you think of the the kind of testosterone that's kind of shooting around these these warriors in order to demonstrate their their reputation. Um, you know, it, it, it kind of leads people to do stupid things. You know, the adrenaline before the battle it leads people to do uh, you know acts of of what we what we might say idiocy. So some you know some of the warriors would be quite sensible, but some of them would would presumably um, you know wish to to do these 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 kind of activities and, and of course that's about that's about the morale this kind of scale of battle isn't quite able to uh to to um to depict that that kind of thing going on uh in in some ways we can't quite see the individual warrior when one, one man represents 60 on the battlefield mm. but uh, you know hey we can you know we can imagine it so we're doing pretty well. We're up to the English are taking thirty five percent casualties. We've taken eleven percent. So that uh, strategy of of engaging with the uh, with the cavalry um, has really um, really paid off. Um, they their counter attack has not been anywhere near as uh, effective as I've seen in, in past attempts. Um, you know, I, I tried the, the I guess, the, the more historical approach of, of having the infantry engage and then utilize the cavalry through uh, later gaps in the line or, or, or flanking maneuvers. Um, mm. But yeah, br whittling them down and, and starting to, to break apart. But we now have this almost uh, V-shaped formation um, created where the, the, the center, the English have pushed have pushed through a little bit but the the norman knights have still held their own supported now by the infantry and uh mm. the right the right flanking units now is is now pulling away and actually splitting apart that uh that english line a fair bit allowing uh the the knights to to really have a sort of the pick of their targets now because there's so many units facing different directions um they can they can have a little bit of a of a field day just just picking the, the choice targets i am i am cautiously keeping an eye on on harold godwinson who is sat uh, sat atop uh, a hill of a of hundred height uh, sort of in the in the middle left of the of the english line uh, surrounded now by by norman units and just sort of hoping that i can bring in a strong enough infantry unit to, to pin him in place and then to uh to invite him to a to a cavalry charge. <laughs> Oops. Yeah, it would be useful. Yeah. Duke William's still standing, so that's uh, that's good. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's useful to have your uh, your your general still alive, isn't it? So it's. Uh... Yeah, I I think one of the, the the things about the you know sort of representing this as a as a basically as a war game is that uh, you know you can't have too many sub leaders within the uh, within the army and somebody had asked about Robert's uh, Count of Mortain um, or, or Mortain uh, on the the battlefield I 
sadly he's not represented actually but he's one of the triumvirate on the uh, the bio tapestry and um, william's taking advice from his two half brothers so um robert was his other um his other uh, half brother odo bishop odo of bayeux was the the other and um you know quite what what he would have done i'm afraid i can't uh, can't necessarily uh <laughs> can't necessarily answer that so off the top of my head beyond uh, remembering that he's on the uh, on the Bayer tapestry but uh, you know but basically the Norman line is, is made up of these um, this generation of uh, noblemen who had grown up with Duke William had fought with him William had faced a whole host of uh, rebellions during his um, his youth when he'd um, taken over as as the duke and uh, basically the the figures um in england at the end of the 11th century who've received land um as a result of the norman conquest so those who had supported uh, william during his his youth and, and basically these were his his trusted men and, and trusted uh, trusted friends and 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 they were being rewarded so i i, I think of um, in some ways England as this giant checkbook, in a sense, uh, for, for Duke William. Maybe checkbook isn't quite the right analogy. I, I don't think I've used a check for years, but uh, the, basically William is sort of writing out these checks uh, prior to the uh, uh, prior to the Norman invasion and promising lands uh, to, to his followers. And then, uh, you know, that's, that is what, uh, what sort of drives the success is that those who are following William are not just going to be rewarded with William's own wealth, but they're going to be rewarded with uh, landed wealth once the kingdom has, has been taken. So Robert of, of Mortain um, had, you know, was, was very, uh, very successful as a, as a result of this, you know, became very wealthy from, from land uh, as, a, as a result of uh, his, his participation in, uh, in, the, uh, the, in the 1066 campaign. Uh, as did a number of others but you know sadly we don't have quite so many names uh, of the the different groups and different leaders you know some of them i think what what we probably have to do is imagine uh, that uh, they have these uh, these different names uh Thurston fitz rolf uh, is is named uh on the on the norman line i noticed earlier today and um Just he to find was him if he's, if he's yeah still with he, us. <laughs> oh, is he still alive? Because he was William's standard bearer at Hastings. He, he may not have actually been a general. He may have been uh, uh, is... William's trusted standard bearer. Yeah, he's still uh, alive. His unit has just broken, yeah. so they're now skirting down behind the uh, behind the main line as they yeah, sort of flee the battlefield. Yeah, his banner's waving a little bit, which tends to be, I think, Field of Glory's uh, sort of indication of uh, uh, things yeah. looking a bit shaky. <laughs> it's gone a bit white, hasn't it? <laughs> Yeah, it's in a in a full route at the moment, I think. But he might he might well uh, rally like uh, Alan, who's uh, who's back and actually now uh, able to to get close to to King Harold, potentially follow up with some uh, with some charges. Although okay. we have now got the English to forty one percent with more than twenty five percent with less than twenty five percent of our own casualties, so we might actually be in a position to win the battle. Uh, on the uh, computer's next Shoot turn. Forward, right. Okay, that's that will be fantastic because I'm 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 going to need my dinner soon. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so yeah, that that kind of leads to a a, a question actually about the, the the sort of average life of a of a soldier in this period. Of, uh, and I think for the for the nobility, it's um, medieval campaigning is about uh, continuing to live your life as a um as a as a nobleman basically demonstrating the, the the kind of high status of nobility and um effectively being able to um to to kind of live out the life on the road but also to uh to kind of make those connections to continue to make those connections that that, that make your position as a member of the high nobility uh continuing to be of high status and um so eating and, and and feasting is is part of the the life on campaign for the nobility and uh you know they're the people who are making the decisions in these uh, these campaigns, and uh, so it's 
little surprise that we see this this kind of uh, cooking al fresco on the the Bayer tapestry, the eating the dinner from the shields, and uh, Odo of Bayer blessing the dinner because that that's the the, the kind of thing that uh, really emphasises the, um, the the kind of success uh, of the the army and and being able to eat and drink well is, is part of what kind of creates this this sense of group identity for the uh, for the nobility, and then there's this whole load of uh, you know so-called other ranks who are who are making this possible, and I I do wonder about the the kind of peasantry in the army whether in these armies whether the peasantry are actually there in order to uh, to move the wine barrels or to move the beer barrels or to move the you know, bring the the meat to the table uh, for the the high consuming nobility and um, you know maybe some of these these figures on the battlefield of uh, nursing hangovers on the uh, <laughs> on the battle despite what the normans uh, sources said about uh, about them uh, fasting before the battle i suspect there's a, there's a kind of combination of, of the two you know some some would probably uh, have, have fasted for the religious purposes of the battle but uh, you know, some of them as well would be eating and, and drinking well before the battle because it's, it's part of their, their group identity uh, for for the battle um, but the you know other other people who who would have been less wealthy uh, within the army as well as those who are, are doing the sort of logistical support that maybe the, the crossbowmen the archers um, and and potentially also some of the those uh, within the, the the kind of line um it must be very tough actually i mean if, if you don't have a horse if you don't have a tent um if you're if you're you know if you're not able to to carry the food with you that you you need um life must be exceptionally tough there and uh, somebody had commented earlier about uh, wearing contemporary shoes you know imagine marching on foot all the way down from the north of england uh, or marching all the way down from from London as well uh, to, to to see off the Normans marching on foot must uh, you know kind of put you in the, the best of positions uh, to, to have a battle. Hooray! The enemy has lost heart. <laughs> so uh, we, did Harold die? Or, uh, he um, the enemy is defeated. You wish to accept victory gra uh, gracefully and let the enemy withdraw without further bloodshed. Not let any enemy formation. I honor is satisfied. Let the slaughter end. Uh, we'll let the slaughter end so that so that Ryan can can feast in glorious uh, triumph. Um, so there we go. We can see we can review the battlefield if we want to. Uh, Harold is still alive. He's still over here. He actually led one last charge into the Breton spearmen as his kind of final action before uh, before victory. Um, uh, fell to the to the Norman, so we can we can end our battlefield review, and then we can see so that the numbers um, f for this scenario in Field of Glory Two Medieval for the Battle of Hastings gives the English eight thousand and fifty two, and the Normans five thousand seven hundred and ninety seven. Uh, in total, in our battle here, the Normans have lost twenty one percent of their force, one thousand two hundred thirty nine, and the English have lost fifty percent, four thousand and ninety one. So they're well and truly broken from this. Um, and uh, yeah, they won't be able to uh, bring together such a such a force ever ever again under under their own banners. Yeah, yeah. And we get this this kind of impression from uh, the Battle of Hastings that a battle needs to result in the, the death of the, the leader. But the Battle of Hastings is kind of unusual in, in the in the death of Harold. So congratulations uh yeah, all the same i think you'll be able to bring him to heel bring harold to heel and, and i'm sure he'll yeah. negotiate terms of surrender there we go <laughs> Lan so, I did... the normans <laughs> 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 well i think for once i mean in terms of my reputation as a as a cavalry killer we lost a, um we lost a total of a hundred uh, 126 cavalry were killed 258 were wounded uh, and twelve were captured or deserted. So I think, uh, I, th I think those are good odds for uh, mm. my my cavalry command today. I think that's that's acceptable, acceptable terms. Um, <laughs> luck or skill? Well, <laughs> uh, history written by the victors on this day will will say that uh, it was through skill of cavalry command. I think. Yes. Yes. Indeed. Yeah. So. So good stuff. Yeah. We will. 
I think perhaps just one or two final questions. Yeah, yeah. There's, <laughs> uh, there's still a number of uh, a number of questions, and I'm not sure. I, I apologise if I haven't uh, been able to to answer all of the the questions. Um, I, I noticed somebody was still asking the, the question about Robert and Mortan, but I answered that as best as I could. Um, but the, the, there was a question about the Bayer Tapestry and whether that is uh, propaganda. And in many ways, that is propaganda, basically. It's, it's um, created, although it's created probably in Canterbury in England, um, on uh, Odo of Bayer's estates in, in England, um, it's uh, it's created for Odo, and uh, what it's doing is it's emphasising uh, Bishop Odo's uh, part in the uh, in the Battle of Hastings at the time that it was made. Probably in the late 1070s, Bishop Odo was uh, uh, w- was kind of persona non grata with uh, with William, and, and maybe it was a kind of attempt to for Odo to redeem himself. So we see like Bayeux being an important place which of course Bayer is an important place, but we see it being an important place uh, on the the narrative of the, the tapestry and Odo having this, this kind of pivotal role in the battle. And it really, really emphasises the, the horses and, uh, you know, emphasises them in more ways than the one uh, as well if... Uh, you, you know, if you look at the tapestry, it's kind of obvious how it's emphasising the, the kind of masculinity of the, the Normans uh, by by way of the horses. And um, that, you know, the Victorians who made a replica of the, the Bayer tapestry were uh, somewhat more prudish in, in, in depicting it. Um, but it, what, it, what it's doing is, is kind of emphasising that, that narrative of a victory, you know, the initial setback of the Normans, as we saw today, the initial setback, the initial victory uh, of the English. And it's telling it in a good story because, uh, sorry, the, the Normans are initially successful uh, and then the setback and then they, then they are uh, they're successful again. And then there's this, this kind of last uh, gasp of the English. And what it's trying to do is show that Harold is a usurper, which <laughs> I've said it already and I'll probably get hate mail for saying it, but Harold was a usurper. Uh, but William was also a usurper and he doesn't tell that side of things. <laughs> And it's, what it's trying to do is emphasise. Oh, well, yeah, William was uh, was, was uh, a legitimate ruler of the English, and uh, it's, it's emphasising his his right to rule. But you know, he he was um, chancing. You know, he'd, he'd conquered areas around Normandy. He conquered Maine or Man uh, nearby, one of the counties nearby. Uh, he put down rebels, and, and and basically he's he's seeing what else he could go for and and, and taking his chances, and it paid off. For him. Huge thanks to Ryan for joining me today on the stream. Big thanks to Slytherin and Immediate Media for bringing it all together uh, and uh, letting us uh, do this event. It's been absolutely yeah. brilliant. I think. Uh, very safe to say, judging by all the all the, the comments uh, in the chat, that you guys have really enjoyed this format as well. And um, hopefully it's something perhaps we can do again soon with, with other battles um, throughout history and in Field of Glory to Medieval. And uh, perhaps maybe even we'll do, a, we'll do a, a showdown between myself and Ryan at some point. <laughs> oh my god <laughs> really see the uh see a decisive victory on, on somebody's part i think and i, I you know i don't think it will be me <laughs> <But> <laughs> we'll, we'll but, but, yeah but yeah thank you thank you oh, so fantastic. much for, for joining me oh, they've Ryan. Been, yeah they've been great questions from your your crew there it's, it's been great so uh, thank you very much I've, I've enjoyed it immensely yeah, it's been a lot of fun and, and brilliant to um get to to work alongside you again uh, after okay. oh, ten, 10 years since my, my time at Winchester. So um, <laughs> thank you very much. Finally, once again, thank you to everyone for tuning in today. Thank you for all the brilliant questions. Thank you to Professor Ryan Lavelle. Until the next one, ciao for now. Okay, cheerio.